In the early morning hours of November 16th, after years of construction and months of testing, NASA's SLS rocket finally got its chance to tear through the night sky at 1.47 a.m., burning brighter than any other rocket that's come before, the most powerful flying machine to ever leave the Earth. It was an epic fireworks show, but that was only the beginning of the most crucial spaceflight mission that NASA has taken on in decades. Artemis 1 is a historic flight for many reasons, and now that the SLS has proven its muscle, all eyes are on the Orion spacecraft as it sets out on a 25-day mission into deep space. Artemis 1 and its crew of mannequins, microbes, and measuring devices have a very busy few weeks ahead of them. So, here is everything you need to know about the flight of Artemis 1. This is the space race. So the first thing that everyone is going to remember about Artemis 1 was the dramatic launch of this massive rocket ship. After a famous stretch of false starts, what we saw on November 16th was a textbook NASA launch. Everything went off without a hitch. Unfortunately, their perfect launch window just happened to open at 1am Eastern Time, but if that's what they had to do to get this thing off the ground, so be it. Of course, all rocket launches are exciting and look really cool, but those two side boosters on the SLS are unlike anything that we've ever seen before. Artemis rode a massive column of fire and smoke into the heavens. This made for the brightest rocket launch to date, lighting up the Florida coast and turning night into day. These solid rocket boosters took the crown as the most powerful rocket motors ever launched. The original design from the space shuttle was refurbished for SLS with 20% more power. The side boosters are so bright and so powerful that you could hardly even see the four RS-25 hydrogen engines burning away. There was an epic moment where the side boosters broke away from the core stage and you could see them still pulling these massive trails of sparks as they started to fall back to the earth where they eventually splashed down in the ocean. After that, the hydrogen burning core stage of the SLS continued on its way towards space, giving the Orion spacecraft the velocity it needed to escape the atmosphere before the core separated and that giant iconic booster also fell back to Earth for a splashdown. From there, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage took over. This is basically just one more rocket engine, an RL-10 that burns the same liquid hydrogen fuel as the core booster. This stage of the rocket has to first raise the Orion spacecraft up into a low Earth orbit so that it doesn't fall back down like the core stage does. And then about 20 minutes later, the ICP makes the final push to send the Orion into a translunar injection orbit. With that done, we saw the final stage separation, the ICP is let go from the Orion, and that ICP actually serves a dual purpose. Now that it's done the job of sending Orion to the moon, the ICP is full of CubeSats, tiny satellites that are going to deploy as it floats around in cislunar space. One of those CubeSats, the NEA Scout, is actually on its way to go study a near-Earth asteroid after deploying a 925 square foot solar sail. Another, called the Lunar Ice Cube, will search for water in all forms with an infrared spectrometer during a 7-hour orbit around the moon. And the CUSP satellite will go on to orbit the sun after its release to study radiation from the sun, solar winds, and other solar events. So that's where we are at right now. The largest, heaviest spacecraft since Apollo is on its way to the moon, traveling at a velocity of about 5,500 miles per hour or 8,800 kilometers per hour. The service module has its own rocket engine that will be performing a few more burns to set the final course around the moon and then back home again. Okay, here are the next few milestones for Artemis 1 that we are looking forward to. Monday, November 21st, T plus 6 days from launch, Orion will perform its lowest flyby of the moon, coming within just 60 miles or 100 kilometers of the surface. So, be on the lookout for that. This flyby maneuver is going to use the moon's gravity to slingshot Orion out into deep space. The service module will perform another burn with its rocket engine on day 10, November 25th, 
and that's going to insert the spacecraft into a distant retrograde orbit that will take it 38,000 miles or 61,000 kilometers above the lunar surface. On day 13, Orion will break the record set by Apollo 13 and reach the greatest distance away from the Earth for a crew-rated spaceship. That's going to be nearly 300,000 miles or 480,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. Now, Apollo 13 didn't go that far out on purpose. They were making a last-ditch effort to slingshot their dying spacecraft around the moon and make it back home before they all suffocated. And this is where things get really interesting for the crew of Artemis 1. Yes, there are no people on board, but there is a very important crew riding inside the Orion capsule. Strapped into the commander's chair is Munikin Campos. This guy is named after Arturo Campos, an electrical engineer who was a key player in bringing the before-mentioned Apollo 13 mission back home safely. He didn't make it into the Tom Hanks movie, I don't think, but he's finally getting cred with Artemis 1. The mannequin is equipped with internal sensors for radiation and sensors in its seat to record gravimetric and vibrational forces during flight. Remember that Artemis 1 is all about testing this flight system for its future as a crew capsule. Accompanying our man Campos are two phantom mannequins. These are Helga and Zohar. They don't have limbs or spacesuits, they're just a couple of torso busts that contain over 6,000 passive sensors and 34 active dosimeters each. Those are sensors to measure radiation. Helga and Zohar were built using materials that mimic human bone and muscle tissue. The torsos actually include these components that are specific to female anatomy in order to mimic ovaries and breast tissue, which are more susceptible to radiation. They're going to study the effectiveness of a specialized radiation vest called AstroRad. The hope is that the AstroRad can provide effective radiation protection for the astronaut's vital organs if the capsule were to be hit by a radiation event in deep space. So only Zohar will wear the AstroRad vest and Helga will serve as a control. Once the mannequins are back on Earth, researchers will compare radiation exposures between the pair. And the mannequins aren't the only crew members of Artemis 1. There is actually life on board that capsule. Scientists included 12 bags of baker's yeast into the Artemis 1 payload. The idea is that the microorganisms will stand in for actual people and give us some idea of what the radiation levels of deep space will do to living cells. Another cool experiment being done are the moon trees. There are 1,000 tree seeds on board Artemis 1. These are provided by the USDA Forest Service and feature five different species of tree seeds. Loblolly pine, American sycamore, sweet gum, giant sequoia, and Douglas fir. The idea is that the seeds will fly around the moon and then be planted here on Earth. This was actually done once before with seeds flown on Apollo 14 in 1971. They won't grow into mutant alien trees or anything like that. It's more like a living reminder of what people are capable of when we work together. Speaking of sentimental items, Artemis 1 is also bringing along some souvenirs from previous lunar missions. A number of small artifacts from the National Air and Space Museum collection were included in the official flight kit. There is a bolt from one of the Apollo 11's F-1 rocket engines, which was recovered from the ocean floor a decade ago, an Apollo 8 commemorative coin made in part with metal from the Apollo 8 mission, and a commercial mission patch from the Apollo 17 mission purchased at Kennedy Space Center in the 1970s. They also brought Snoopy along for the ride. That's right, Charlie Brown's sidekick has been a long-standing de facto mascot for NASA's human spaceflight program. Apollo 10's lunar module was named Snoopy back in 1969 and gives out the Silver Snoopy Award in recognition of an individual's exceptional work towards mission success and human flight safety. So there is a plush Snoopy with his own orange spacesuit inside Artemis 1 just floating around right now. He was used scientifically as a zero-g indicator when the capsule reached orbit. After making its dip into interstellar space on day 16, December 1st, Orion's engine will fire up again for a departure burn. 
That's going to put it on course for a second flyby of the moon on day 20, and then there will be one final kick from the engine to set Orion on its return journey to Earth. On December 11th, Orion will arrive back home, barreling into Earth's atmosphere at about 25,000 miles per hour, or 40,000 kilometers per hour. This is the fastest re-entry speed ever attempted, so it will be a huge test for the capsule and its heat shield, which will endure temperatures up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 2,750 degrees Celsius. Orion will then splash down under parachutes in the Pacific Ocean, bringing the Artemis 1 mission to a close. But really, Artemis 1 is just the beginning of the beginning for a new era of human spaceflight. Based on what scientists all around the world can learn from this test flight, we can begin the process of readying Artemis 2, the first crewed flight of the SLS and Orion spacecraft. Artemis 2 will follow a similar flight plan as Artemis 1, but this time bringing human beings to lunar space for the first time since 1972. Artemis 2 will be an eight-day mission that will provide the final data that we need to confirm that Artemis is capable of sending people to the moon's surface. The crew for Artemis 2 has yet to be named, but we know that there will be four astronauts on board, three from NASA, and one person from the Canadian space program. We basically traded them another robotic arm for the Lunar Gateway Station in exchange for a ride to the moon. It's a pretty good deal if you ask me. The launch date is tentatively set for 2024, providing that all data from Artemis 1 indicates that Artemis 2 is ready for flight. We won't know that answer for probably a few months. But in the meantime, we've got a lot to look forward to as we follow Artemis 1 on its journey into deep space. Be sure to subscribe for more on this story as it develops. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.